1971, a group of anti-war activists broke into an office building in Media, Pennsylvania. They were searching for records of the Selective Service System, the U.S. government agency in charge of drafting young men into the Army to fight in the Vietnam War. The activists planned to destroy any draft records they found. But the draft agency shared offices with the FBI, and accidentally, the activists discovered FBI files documenting many years of illegal war by the U.S. government against civil rights, anti-war, and other progressive movements. They had stumbled upon a highly secret official U.S. government program named the Counterintelligence Program, or COINTELPRO. They didn't destroy the files, but leaked them to the U.S. press, breaking open the shocking story of COINTELPRO. Back in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 1970s, the United States government had programs, some involving simple surveillance, some involving ways of getting information, some involving plots, basically to frame people for crimes, and some involving outright murder. It was secret at the time because it was by and large illegal. Really what COINTELPRO is, is, you know, a militarization of criminal justice. It was a cold word that was used by the FBI, actual war against the entire left movement. To eliminate, intimidate, incarcerate, and terrorize a people. It was a covert war strategy, and it was done because the government thought there was a war going on. In the 1950s, the U.S. government launched attacks against mass movements for social justice. This program was called COINTELPRO. It was spearheaded by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI with the support of military and police agencies nationwide. The goal of COINTELPRO, without pretense of legality, was to destroy leaders and organizations, to sow division and distrust. Of course, repression against peoples of color, poor and working people, and progressive organizations in the U.S. goes back hundreds of years, beginning with genocide against Native Americans and African slavery, as well as a war of conquest against Mexico and the colonization of Puerto Rico. Earlier in the 20th century, anarchists and socialists were imprisoned and deported. Later, there was intense repression and infiltration against the Communist Party and progressive trade unions. As the civil rights movement brought millions of people into new social consciousness, COINTELPRO unleashed wider and more murderous onslaughts against the growing unity of movements for social change. You were carrying out what you thought was official governmental policy, were you not? Yes, sir. And you thought you were doing what the President of the United States wanted you to do. Despite congressional investigations, many of COINTELPRO's crimes are not fully known. Activists who experienced it firsthand hold important lessons for the present and future. COINTELPRO was most active at a time when peoples around the world were fighting against U.S. imperialism. You had the, the war in Vietnam. You had countries in Africa struggling against colonialism and demanding independence in Latin America as well. And then you also had within the borders of this country, people of color also struggling against white supremacy and for empowerment in their own communities. COINTELPRO's attacks on left-wing organizations and against the civil rights and black liberation movements have received some attention, but it's less well known that one of COINTELPRO's first targets 
was the movement for Puerto Rican independence. In 1897, Puerto Rico was granted autonomy by the Spanish Empire, only to be invaded by the United States in 1898. Since then, Puerto Ricans have struggled against U.S. colonialism, led by activists like Pedro Albizu Campos. By the mid-1950s, as movements for independence surged around the world, the Puerto Rican National Liberation Movement had reached a new and impressive strength. In 1950, the Nationalist Party attempted to assassinate President Harry Truman, and in 1954, four nationalists attacked the U.S. Congress. One of the first documents that the FBI issued, that J. Edgar Hoover issues, that constitutes what could be called a COINTELPRO document, was really issued against the Puerto Rican independence movement. In this uh, missive that J. Edgar Hoover sends out to the San Juan office is that everything has to be done, that you should gather all pertinent information, including personal information, on the independence leaders to expose them that would lead to divisions, that would lead to disruption and the destruction of the movement. In 1978, it's revealed that there are files on 165,000 adults in Puerto Rico. Well, in Puerto Rico, in order to get a job, you had to have a certificate of good conduct. Who issued the certificate of good conduct? The Puerto Rican police. But if you had a file, you didn't have a certificate of good conduct. What did, what did this mean? It meant that Puerto Ricans who were in any way associated with the Puerto Rican independence movement or were supportive of the Puerto Rican independence movement had a file on them and it was very difficult for them to get jobs in Puerto Rico. It was all driven by the FBI and it was part of the FBI's COINTELPRO program that these files were kept. Not only were files kept, but organizers and activists were targeted in other ways by the U.S. government. The COINTELPRO activities of police agencies led to the setup and murder of Puerto Rican independence fighters Carlos Soto Arivi and Arnaldo Dario Rosado in Cerro Maravilla in 1978. In the United States, the COINTELPRO program reacted to the growing organization and militants of the Puerto Rican community. An FBI informant in Chicago infiltrated an activist family, spread vicious rumors, and was responsible for the imprisonment of leaders. We had an FBI informant, Rafael Marrero, that um, married my sister. He was totally involved in the political work. He really knew how to do political work, and he wasn't lazy. But I remember talking to my sister about this because he never had a job, even though he did political work. My sister fed him, my sister clothed him, my sister was raising their daughter. The destructive personal and political betrayals of FBI infiltrator Morero took place at a time when both of his wife's sisters, there's, 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 Lucy there's, there's, and Alicia Rodriguez, were political prisoners. He was just a leech, you know, and personally, and then a leech in the movement, and then he leaves, and then all these awful things that that he did to to, you know, against people that I knew were giving of their life and their essence to the struggle. A prominent activist in prison due to his actions was Jose Solis a professor of education in Chicago who was charged in connection with an attempted bombing of a military recruiter that had, in fact, been set up by Marrero. That's what Rafael Marrero, who was the agent stationed here, was supposed to do. Actually did carry out a bombing, and he tried to then put the blame on Puerto Rican activists and people who promoted Puerto Rican independence Jose Solis spent many years in prison and, and his 
marriage broke up and his children suffered. The FBI takes no responsibility. Yet, in the case of Rafael Marrero, we know that he was paid several million dollars to carry out what he did. He was wine and dine in the best hotels. We, we had all the evidence that was revealed through the discovery documents of Jose Solis' case. And yet the FBI assumes no responsibility for them. The U.S. government continues to target the Puerto Rican independence movement and to imprison Puerto Rican activists. The FBI, in its own words, saw, saw a real threat in what I would term the efforts towards self-determination and community empowerment. And not only in the Black Panther Party, but certainly the Young Lords in the Puerto Rican movement and other organizations. The story of Native American resistance extends back more than 500 years. It's a struggle that has never ceased. In the 1960s, it underwent a resurgence highlighted by the occupations of Alcatraz Island and San Francisco Bay and of Wounded Knee and the Pine Ridge Reservation, one of the many areas where, in 1890, the U.S. Army committed genocide. There were numerous other demonstrations and occupations demanding sovereignty and upholding treaty rights. In the wake of the uprising at Wounded Knee, FBI and Bureau of Indian Affairs supported goon squads, attacked people who fought for human rights and sovereignty. Many local native activists were killed or imprisoned, and some leaders, such as Leonard Peltier of AIM, the American Indian Movement, were framed and to this day remain in prison. The early 1970s, the American Indian Movement began asserting treaty rights within the rubric of national liberation movements to restore active sovereignty to native nations. So you have basically the FBI, that is a law enforcement agency as it's chartered within the United States, fulfilling a counterinsurgency function on American Indian reservations, particularly the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, but others as well, during the mid-1970s. I was based here in San Francisco and on, on the AIM uh, Council for the San Francisco Bay Area. So we were getting reports from everywhere. You know, Pine Ridge was just one place we were dealing with after Wounded Knee. I think they cared more about the grassroots leaders getting rid of them than about the, you know, the national spokespeople. But these local leaders, incarcerating them and, you know, just, they were destroyed. They were destroyed by it. They created these, uh, what we would later learn from Central Americans were death squads to just kill leaders, to terrorize people, break into houses and start shooting people, and just a free reign of weapons being provided, and especially ammunition, really armor-piercing, hollowed out, uh, you know, these kinds of things that are our military issue being given to these guardians of the Oglala Nation. They call themselves the Goon Squad. The emblematic case to come out of the, uh, the FBI campaign, the counterinsurgency campaign against the American Indian movement during the 70s, is, of course, that of Leonard Peltier. And that's an individual who was part of an armed security team on Pine Ridge that uh, was willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the FBI and its surrogates, the, the death squad surrogates that were mustered out of the Bureau of Indian Affairs police there in order to break the back of the movement, make an example of it as to the cost and consequence of actually trying to stand on your rights as an American Indian. We started our own programs too, you know, the American Indian Movement. We started, and but we patterned them after, after uh, the Black Panthers uh, organizations. We had free breakfasts, free. Uh, we built schools. We have our own clinics. Uh, we went into, of course, communications. A lot of the things that the Panthers did, uh, we patterned our ideas off of. The women from Pine Ridge begged the AIM people to send a sizable group of people who could be there to protect them in their, you know, these, these very isolated little compounds of the 
of these full blood Indians, um, elder people, they were getting harassed all the time by the, the goons. And these two FBI agents drove right in at high speed, freaked everyone out. And so, you know, there was a firefight and those two FBI agents ended up dead. Peltier was convicted of killing two FBI agents in a firefight in June of 75 on Pine Ridge. The upshot, however, is that there's no one, including even his prosecutors at trial, that have been able to say or willing to say at any point in the last 25 years, as it stands right now, that they actually know that he did what he was convicted of doing. In most cases, they're not even willing to say they believe he did what he was convicted of doing. Of course, a big movement built up, and Leonard has become not only a symbol, but a true spiritual leader, you know, of, of the whole movement. And AIM, you know, is weakened beyond really existing, but the American Indian movement without the dots, you know, without the acronym, has uh, largely survived. What you can say is that Leonard Peltier is not serving time, although his sentence is two consecutive life terms in prison. He's not in prison at this point for anything resulting from a valid conviction. He is in prison as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government to visit these kinds of consequences on American Indians first and foremost, because that's what he represents, Indian resistance, pursuit of Indian rights, but more broadly, He's a symbol of the cost and consequence the government wants you to believe it can impose for your standing, no matter who you are, what group you represent. Attempting to stand in your rights can put you in a cage next to Leonard Peltier. Think about it. Much of the Southwest, including Texas, California, Colorado, and other states, were part of Mexico until the Mexican-American War in the late 1840s, when the U.S. military stole the land from Mexico. This history of conquest, the idea of an occupied land, and a culture of resistance have played a central role in the ongoing struggles of Chicano-Mexicano people. In the 1960s, amidst demands in the farm worker fields for immigrant rights on campuses and in city barrios, the movement gathered strength and gave birth to dynamic leaders. Less well known than some of the other crimes of COINTELPRO are those committed against the Chicano Mexicano movements. Quantel Pro probably just didn't hit us in Colorado. It hit us in Nuevo Mexico. It hit us in California. You know, the, the Mexican people have always resisted. There was a war, uh, it was in a, between unequals, and there was a conquest. And that's the root of relations between the Mexican people in the United States and the federal government. I would suggest that anybody who is an active organizer in the community that's making social change would quickly become a target of the United States government. If you go into to New Mexico and you have uh, Linda Montoya at Escuela Aslan, an alternative school that's created, she's killed by the police in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And then you go into the assassination of Rito Canales and Antonio Cordova of the, the Black Berets that were set up by the police. And these guys were brittle. They were shot like 30 some times, you know, on the pretext that they were trying to steal dynamite. Widespread attacks on the Chicano movement in the Southwest continued. In 1974 in Boulder, Colorado, during an upsurge in the Chicano student movement, six young activists were killed in two separate car bombings. They are called Los Seis de Boulder and are honored to this day. We lost a lot of leadership and we lost a lot of potential. And beyond the individuals who died, the spirit kind of died there. 
Although COINTELPRO was a federal program, the FBI and other federal agencies worked in close coordination with local police and encouraged right-wing visual antis, launching joint attacks, infiltrations, and surveillance. One example of this use of right-wing groups is the assassination of Ricardo Falcón, a promising young Chicano leader who sought to build greater unity. He could move the people in the prisons. He could move the people in the barrios and he could move the students. So to me, he was a real example of what was coming. In 1972, a right-wing vigilante named Perry Brunson shot and killed 22-year-old Ricardo Falcone. Falcone was riding in a car with other activists to a Chicano political party convention in El Paso, Texas. When the car overheated, they stopped at a gas station in Oro Grande, New Mexico. The owner of the gas station comes out and he says to the group, you Chicano motherfuckers are all alike. And he walks back into the station. So Ricardo says to the group, I'm going to go in and see what's going on with this guy and pay him for the pay for the water. As he walks into the gas station, he opens the door. Perry Brunson's inside the counter inside inside and in front of him is a counter. And he reaches into the counter and pulls out a 38 and shoots Ricardo five times. And uh, and so then Ricardo attempts to reach over and pull the gun from him. Uh, one of the gentlemen that's out in the car hears the gunshots. He runs in and he, he then tr wrestles Perry Brunson to the ground for the gun. Ricardo has turned around and walked out of the gas station and then collapses and he bleeds to death. The man who, who assassinated Ricardo Falcón was an organizer for the American Independent Party. In his gas station, the day of Ricardo Falcón's murder, he had a petition there for people who wanted to sign to have George Wallace's name put on the ballot in New Mexico in November of 1972. Brunson was acquitted by an all-white jury and never spent a day in jail. Supporters have attempted to obtain COINTELPRO documents about Ricardo Falcón. I think that the activities that Ricardo Falcón was involved in, the organizing of students in Boulder, the bringing of the community together, the empowering of people in Northern Colorado, I think are, are, are some of the key factors that led to his assassination in Oro Grande. I participated in the trial. I saw some of the evidence and I'm convinced that Ricardo Falcón, it was no inc coincidence that he, that he was killed in Oro Grande. Throughout all these years, I filed for his Freedom of Information files, and I have yet to receive one document from the government. They refused to release any of the records concerning his Freedom of Information file. Today, here we are looking at it uh, some 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 40 years ago almost. And some of these things say, oh my God, how can you believe that those things could have ever happened? Well, I'll tell you what, the federal government thought they could have happened because they wouldn't have done some of the things that they did. COINTELPRO targeted many movements and damaged people and organizations, from the Puerto Rican, Native American, and Chicano movements to the mostly white left, the huge anti-war movement, and student groups like Students for a Democratic Society. In many ways, these movements grew out of the energy and inspiration of the civil rights movement, first in the South and then throughout the country. It was the leaders of the civil rights and black liberation movements who J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI thought represented the greatest threat, had the most potential to bring unity to and transform the many movements into a force united and powerful enough to overthrow the established order. That was why COINTELPRO infamously included a list of black leaders to be neutralized. It was within this context that the assassinations of Malcolm X and then Martin Luther King Jr. took place. Massive rebellions took place in African-American communities in many cities. As repression intensified, a more militant black liberation movement emerged. Vicious tactics, trumped up charges, and calculated assassinations were unleashed against SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, against the Black Panther Party, and against RAM, the Revolutionary Action Movement.
Life magazine put out uh, in June, I think, of 1966, the plot to get Whitey. All right. And it, and it is stated that I was head of a thousand blood brothers across the country that was planning to wage guerrilla warfare. Of course, the Black Liberation Movement is a priority at that time because the Black Liberation Movement and the quote unquote Black Rebellion in the country at that time was uh, gaining some significant momentum. COINTELPRO was a governmental conspiracy to liquidate the revolutionary leadership of black America because we were impacting upon the whole country and the leadership had to be liquidated even up to Dr. King because Dr. King had changed. People don't uh, talk about it in those terms right now. We kind of equate and collapse everything into civil rights. But there was um, a, a more militant movement, a movement that was reaching out to global politics in terms of anti-imperialism at that particular moment, and it had tremendous potential. The Black Panther Party was only a, little, a small manifestation of what this infrastructure wanted to do. I'm talking about SNCC. Came up with these brilliant ideas, you know, that had nothing to do with a Huey Newton or a Bobby Seale. We were organizing in the South, in the West, in the East, the symbol of the Panther from the Mississippi Freedom and Democratic Party, Fannie Lou Hamer, all these people I knew I'm growing up with and we see. If you're right, you have to stand on that principle and if it's necessary to die on the principle because I am sick of the racist war in Vietnam when we don't have justice in the United States. The militant aspects is all, it's already there from the deacons on. This is what you did. We grew up in a black nation, a nation that had to protect itself. We are concerned about the survival of black people in this country and that we cannot survive if we go fight some yellow man in Vietnam who ain't never called us nigger. The government saw it as a black Marxist movement growing in the North. We were independent of the Communist Party. We were independent of the Socialist Workers Party. We were independent of all left groups that they had already infiltrated. It was growing. But you also had the Chicano movement developing, uh, Asian American, anti-imperialist, uh, national liberation, consciousness type movement. In the Puerto Rican community, you had the development of that as well as with white students and white youth in, in the formation of SDS and other radical white organizations in that moment. So, you know, uh, in terms of the development of a different type of politics, it scared the hell out of the United States government at that particular moment. And that's why counterinsurgency was developed at that level. In the past, the poor neighborhoods have been exploited by persons or person or persons who have been less than American. There's so many of these anti or, or anti-American, uh, pink, uh, even red organizations. The FBI and the Department of Justice would learn everything about people in a particular organization. And they did that through wiretaps of telephones, of planting bugs in offices, and using informants. The Red Squad, there are those units within the police department or any law enforcement unit that uh, have as their function the investigating and looking into organizations that perhaps are a little on the suspect side or have uh, revealed themselves uh, in such a way as to be a little bit questionable. The FBI broke into our houses. And you would know this because you would come home and you could tell your house had been broken into. Door was locked. Nothing was taken except for maybe some papers. But things were rearranged. The FBI had a way of classifying people who were in the Black Panther Party in many categories, one of which was called the Key Agitator Index. Those are the people who they targeted to be neutralized. Constitutional rights were not a consideration. They were, in fact, secretly and unilaterally suspended by the FBI, with at least the tacit approval of high officials in the federal government for purposes of neutralizing. That's a term that was used within the program itself by those 
FBI officials who were responsible neutralized the political activities that were considered objectionable on the part of the Bureau undertaken by U.S. citizens. Gee, why don't I just have one of my informants in another organization go out and shoot this guy and make it look like some kind of a mixed up drug operation and, you know, have them assassinated. That'll neutralize them for sure. At approximately 2.45 p.m. this afternoon, two men were murdered at the UCLA campus. At UCLA, two you had are... Bunchy Carter, Al Prentice Carter, who was basically the head of the Los Angeles chapter of the Black Panther Party, along with another Panther named John Huggins, who was a key organizer down there, killed by uh, federal undercover personnel, basically, in a classroom at University of California, Los Angeles. This was in uh, Campbell Hall. And, you know, it was just, just cold. They were eliminated. The FBI took credit for that result in its internal memoranda. One agent first told me about the agents, uh, the assassination of Carter and Huggins in Los Angeles. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, but I found out later that uh, he wasn't just joking with me. It was true from looking at the files. Had to do with a disinformation campaign in order to set two political organizations, both of which had been infiltrated, at odds with one another, creating context in which, and since certain of the infiltrators could eliminate bona fide activists on the other side. You then have the FBI agent in charge, a guy by the name of Richard Wallace Held, who now runs security for the Visa Corporation. Agent Held talked about how successful the operation had been and on that basis sought approval for it to be continued. The approval was given. You then have two more Panthers who were killed in San Diego. I said, those aren't the only two assassinations. I said, had two in uh, Chicago. Most famously, perhaps, and best documentedly, have the Hampton-Clark assassination. Fred Hampton, deputy chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. If we didn't talk about a Breakfast for Children program, we've got one. We're not going to tell you how many kids we intend to feed in, feed in Chicago. We're feeding 3,000 to 4,000 every week already, and I don't know how many all around the country. And Mark Clark, who was defense captain for a downstate chapter in Peoria, who was staying in the apartment rented by Mr. Hampton on the 4th of December 1969, when the FBI caused a police arms raid to be executed on the premises, result of which, and this is the cleanest version of it, is that Mr. Hampton and Mr. Clark were shot to death by the police. And the cops lied about it, and state's attorney Edward Hanrahan lied about it, and he was clearly in on it. It came out, the family proved it. They did that to decapitate the movement. We said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, not that I'm locked up, not that everybody's locked up, that you can jail revolutionaries, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. You might run a liberator like every Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting, and if you do, you come up with answers that don't answer explanations that don't explain. You come up with conclusions that don't conclude. Nothing's more important than stopping fascism because fascism will stop us all. The government wanted to wipe out the Panthers and the Young Lords later and the American Indian Movement and, and Weatherman and other parts of the white progressive movements because they saw that there was something that was in flames and they wanted to put it out and the easiest way to put it out was counterinsurgency in the united states the government isn't supposed to use counterinsurgency against its own citizens pigs lives have become so extremely outlandish that they were forced to resort to their ultimate weapon force organized force murder and brutality against black people and the attacks against the Black Panther Party escalated. The very night, January 17, 1969, that I was being tortured, Bunchy, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins were shot by the flunkies of this government. There were numerous false arrests and prosecutions where people spent long time in prison uh, on trumped-up charges. 
On April 2nd of 1969, I was rearrested along with 21 other members of the Black Panther Party on charges of conspiracy to murder some pigs, and attacks against our party still escalated. For example, there was the Panther 21 case in New York where the leadership was basically arrested, spent two years in jail before they were acquitted on all charges. But as a result, the New York chapter was virtually decimated. It was four days after they murdered Fred Hampton in this bed. In Chicago, they shot at me in the bed and tried to do the same thing. One of the key agitators and one of the targets to be neutralized that was very important to them was a young uh, Vietnam vet who had come to Los Angeles to study. He went to college at UCLA on the GI Bill. His name was Elmer Geronimo Pratt, and he was seemed to have been targeted very, very early on. But the FBI had, had gotten rid of uh, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins, and now, now they got Geronimo Pratt, who took their place. And they got to get rid of him. COINTELPRO had an intense interest in the Los Angeles Black Panthers. And at certain point, uh, the LAPD SWAT team attacked the office front on, just, just cleared the streets and started shooting. Geronimo had taught people how to fortify the office. And they tried to bomb the office, and um, it had been sandbagged. And so that didn't work. And eventually, people surrendered. Then they really hated Geronimo because they felt that he had frustrated their desire to destroy the uh, office. Geronimo was not a violent person. He, he definitely was not. That was the thing that bugged the FBI. It's just they had already worked, you know, two assassinations. Uh, the third one might have been a charm. Uh, they might have been discovered. So they worked out something else, which was just as effective. They got him in jail for 25 years. They put a murder on me that they were able to manipulate in such a way that it stuck. A murder that would keep me the uh, a life sentence. I was on the squad. I know he was framed. FBI documents later revealed that their own surveillance placed Geronimo in Oakland at the time of the murders, not in Los Angeles. I don't think there's any doubt that the decision would have been different if we had the amount of information that is available now. We had no clue as to what the government could do or what they did do. Even though Vietnam was going on, you couldn't believe that your government was doing that at home to one of its own citizens, not only one of its own citizens, one of its own veterans. And uh, they really put that together in such a way that anything that we did to try to bring out the truth was already preempted, you know. So this is uh, what they used to keep me in prison for 27 years and to criminalize our revolutionary positions. The whole basis of its political activity, the activity that disturbed the government, that disturbed the status quo, had been essentially neutralized. He was unable to do that, so the mission was accomplished. That was a successful operation. In the investigation conducted by the United States Senate Committee on Intelligence with respect to governmental operations, short term is the Church Committee, they said, I think it was 235 separate actions of COINTELPRO were targeted against the Black Panther Party. So, you know, every chapter that was of any substance was subjected to this. And there are people who've lost their lives, there are people who've lost their mind. There are people who were completely hostile to anything to do with the Black Panthers because they were abused. The only reason why I'm here is I disappeared from four. All right, you know. Many of my comrades have fallen, you know, apartments broken into, some uh, had security apartments and been found handcuffed to the chair and shot in the back of the head. So it's a continuum of disruption or what they call destabilization, just like they destabilize nations, they're destabilizing the entire uh, uh, radical movement one way or another. COINTELPRO was a highly secret program and its crimes might not have been exposed 
were it not for a group of anti-war activists in Pennsylvania. April of 1971, some anti-war activists broke into the FBI field office in Media, Pennsylvania, which also housed the offices of the Selective Service Administration. And this was a time when there was still a draft. And the goal of these activists was to break in, open the drawers, and burn Selective Service records, draft cards, to keep people from getting drafted. So they broke into this office, started opening up the file cabinets, and lo and behold, it was an FBI office, and they saw documents entitled Counterintelligence Program Black Nationalist Hate Groups. And they started reading these documents, took them, didn't burn them, thank goodness, and gave them to um, the press. In addition, at least three domestic subversive targets were the subject of numerous entries from October 1952 to June 1966. Members of the press did their own investigations, which ultimately then led to, in the mid-1970s, an investigation by Senator Frank Church, which became known as the Church Committee, which conducted an investigation into all aspects of government misconduct and surveillance of political organizations in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. We're dealing also with the FBI, a law enforcement agency in this country. And if the law enforcement agencies that are charged with enforcing the law don't themselves obey the law, then who will? Our problem with the CIA has not had to do with its foreign operations but it's had to do with, with uh, violations of the law, which says that the CIA stays out of the domestic affairs of the United States. There was a real purpose for that. The purpose was trying to preserve a free society and not let an intelligence agency in the name of national security begin to erode away the foundations of freedom in our own land. What you see is the government, the government taking it upon itself, the supervision of what is allowed politically and what is not allowed politically. And when those decisions are made by essentially an organization that's a political police force, such as the FBI, or intelligence agencies like the CIA or the Department of Defense Intelligence, when those kind of people are making decisions of what is politically appropriate for the citizens to do, then we don't have a democracy. Then we have essentially a police state because they're only, the police are deciding what can happen. And so that's the fundamental uh, crime of the COINTELPRO program. Whether there's stress or turbulence doesn't really excuse agencies, law enforcement agencies of the government or the president himself from rising above the law and proceeding in lawless fashion. The FBI admitted to the Congress of the United States, that they had over a million documents on the Puerto Rican independence movement. A million documents on a movement of a very small island. And it speaks to how important the COINTELPRO program has been vis-a-vis -vis the Puerto Rican independence movement. They actually intensified with a lot of money their attacks which largely con uh, are comprised of illegal tactics to make the criminal the victim and the victim the criminal to turn everything around. So we couldn't win the hearts and minds of the people if we wanted. So we would begin to be looked upon as the uh, enemies of the people instead of what we were, freedom fighters, fighting for people. So they're using mind games, manipulation, deceit to create confusion, dissension, and end up destroying the leadership. Um, I was in the middle of that. And I would say that the repercussions of that kind of COINTELPRO operation are still present. Whether the death of Ricardo Falcón was an assassination or not, it had a very chilling effect on social movements on communities not only in Colorado, not only in the community that he was born in, but in communities across the United States, across the Southwest. It said to people, if you dare to go out into community and begin to make social change, 
then you are going to have to pay a heavy price for that. No one was ever punished for the illegal activities of government agencies under the COINTELPRO programs. Some people paid a high price for fighting back or resisting this government-led war against progressive movements. George Jackson was one of the Black movement leaders targeted by COINTELPRO for assassination in prison. And some people are still paying a high price. Those who are political prisoners, those who remain locked up some 20, 30, and 40 years later. This is Mumia Abu-Jamal, a former Black Panther who continues to write and broadcast radio commentaries after decades of unjust imprisonment. Many of us have been part of national liberation movement, revolutionary political parties, anti-racist communes, or in the case of people like the Cuban Five, anti-terrorism activists. We've been tried in tribunals where our politics have been our crime, and our political associations our felonies. We need a movement of millions to bring freedom to the brothers and sisters of the Move 9, to bring freedom to Sundiata Akali, to bring freedom to Mutulu Shakur, and hundreds of other political prisoners. We need a movement of millions to make common cause with oppressed people the world over. COINTELPRO is happening today on many different levels and is a lot more sophisticated. And in fact, it doesn't need to be a secret anymore. I believe that it is our ability to transform that repression into meaningful discussion, because it's not just about us saying, well, we need to take the state head on. It is also to engage people in reflections in their homes, in everywhere, to think about not what historically has been done because of COINTELPRO, what is being done right now? How is COINTELPRO really uh, the rubric for um, the Patriot Act and, ho and many aspects of Homeland Security. If it was COINTELPRO then, it's probably COINTELPRO now, maybe a different version or a different name. The same practice is to eliminate, intimidate, incarcerate, and terrorize a people. Certain kinds of searches that were illegal or unconstitutional now under Patriot Act, they can be done. If you involved in radical pro politics, if you're involved in certain forms of even civil disobedience, that you might be charged as a terrorist in this particular country. In Puerto Rico, there is, I believe, a growing movement to really understand the role of the FBI, particularly with the assassination of Filiberto Gera Rios. The FBI pursued Rios, an independence movement leader, for 15 years after he failed to appear for sentencing on robbery charges. On September 23, 2005, the FBI murdered him during an assault on his home in Puerto Rico. That led many people to really question the role of the FBI. What they call this, this great green scare of the last few years, the radical environmental movement, for lack of a better term, this was showcased as being an example of so-called domestic terrorism, although I don't know that it's ever been shown that they hurt anyone. Now the people who are the most serious, most principled activists are in a position of being made into examples of the cost and consequence. Disproportionately harsh, ridiculous sentences, if you want to think about it, under the rubric of terrorism. Now, under the Patriot Act, there doesn't even have to be any crime. People can just be investigated. And guess what? They get investigated because of their politics. They get put on lists. They get under surveillance. Uh, there's all kinds of things that happen to people. They can be whisked off into prisons that no one even knows where they are. They can be tortured. 
They can be brutalized. These are the things that were being done under COINTELPRO as well. But the government said they weren't happening because they were illegal. They could have been charged for violating the law. But now that is the law. There are young people looking for answers. And there are enough victims of COINTELPRO around from the 60s and 70s in every community to warn young people of the traps. There are yet people who have raw wounds walking around from those years. And as long as those wounds don't heal, and as long as society doesn't let them heal, there will be another generation who sees those wounds and will make will, will take those wounds personally and will make the future revolutionaries who will we hope link up someday to people from the other continents who are also oppressed and maybe make for a little improvement. The organized resistance and claims for social and human justice, for political democracy, for economic democracy, have to go into the forefront. And we have to have broader and broader coalitions and stronger and stronger movements. And it has to make a political impact. And so we cannot just say, well, because it's hard, we can't do it. No, it has to be done. There is a long and protracted struggle, but you cannot abandon it. And you have to recognize, as James Foreman always said, we will win without a doubt. The quest for freedom, the quest for equality, and the quest for community. And I think that that's something that systems of greed and oppression try to deny. And I think we have a right, or more important, a responsibility to take those things head on and um, to be part of building movements of resistance. Ultimately, the only safety that we would be able to secure and pass along to our coming generations is not only to confront the nature of the reality reflected in COINTELPRO and comparable sorts of operations from Homeland Security or whoever, but to dismantle the system that gives rise to them and replace it with something that would actually reflect our interests, that would reflect concern with our well-being and reflect a certain sort of respect for the dignity of our communities, our traditions, and us as individuals. Tell pro undercover bags in the mist on the low. Revolutionaries pump your fists like woes. Fight for human rights and your right for yourself. Once upon a time, can't come and tell pro undercover bags in the mist on the low. Revolutionaries pump your fists like woes. Fight for human rights and your right for yourself. Yo, welcome to the misery. How racist the system be? Equality, the plan, Uncle Sam, so shifty. Who cuss clan? Then they whistling Dixie. Power to the people, it's the 1960s. Stand for your freedom, organized, man, it's risky. No justice, no peace, so we want the hood with me. Protect your family, the FBI, sanity, now face reality, police brutality, crimes against humanity. Once upon a time, can't call or tell pros. Undercover feds in the midst on the low. Revolutionaries pump your fists like war wolves. Fight for human rights, so you right for yourself. Freedom fighters, be politicking. CIA, CIA ain't kidding. The new world agenda here. The mark of the beast, police watch their dirty methods. How they spray us with the water hose and sick German shepherds. Now bump that. Matter of fact, we buck back when cops beat you down till you're blue and you're black. 
they had the authority to kill a minority. The laws disorderly. If they didn't want the border to be, tap off my phone, keep tabs on his quarterly. Black Panthers threaten his national security. The ghettos, the pebbles, the soldiers, the rebels. The Russell shows the Herman Belt and shit fits Jerry's. Once upon a time, came Cole and Tell Crows. Undercover fans in the midst on the low. Revolutionaries pump your fists like woke. Fight for human rights and yo, fight for themselves. Once upon a time, can't call and tell pro. Undercover feds in the midst on the love. Revolutionaries pump your fists like woke. Fight for human rights and yo, fight for themselves. Once upon a time, can't call and tell pro. Undercover feds in the midst on the love. Revolutionaries pump. Peace, good people. That was COINTELPRO101. Um, we appreciate you all stopping through today. This is a, um, a special Freedom Fighters Film Festival sponsored by the by iJam, which is the uh, excuse me, Mam Jamil Action Network. Stay tuned each and every day during the um, quote unquote Kwanzaa season. They will have a different film going, so make sure that you tap in. Stay tuned to um, to our YouTube channel so that you can have uh, info on when, what time the other films will be showing. I believe tomorrow's film will be at 6.30 p.m. And um, they have live things going on in these different locations. Today it's in Birmingham. Tomorrow it'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, again, appreciate you all checking it out. Share the film, share the information, let folks know what's going on. Um, and we want to keep on bringing you, you know, the best we can here at Black Power Media. So, um, you know, check us out. Uh, as many of you noticed, um, there were several different people who you've seen on the platform uh, in that particular film. Uh, most recently, we had Bob Boyle on the Remix Morning Show, but we would like to continue to bring you this type of programming and information, uh, but we need your assistance in making it happen. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, um, we see you all. We appreciate, you know, the comments, the retweets, the quotes, all that good stuff. That's, um, you know, it's wonderful. We have a lot of projects coming up. Um, of course, I have a film called Organizing is the New Cool with many of the players that you saw in it that'll be dropping um, later on in 2023. Um, and, you know, books, the whole nine. So again, support IGN International, excuse me, the Mam Jamil Action Network on their Freedom Fighters Film Festival. We are happy to be able to, uh, you know, push it on the platform. Anyway, y'all be safe out there. Uh, it's cold. It's cold in a white man here in Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? And um, a number of other different places. Uh, make sure that you stay on point with our political prisoners because we have a number of different freedom fighters who are you know suffering so we want to make sure that we keep in tune and intact again much love revolutionary love stay on point you know and um we'll see in the whirlwind bpm black power media we out